Hey, everyone. This is um, going to be a slightly different than maybe some of the other presentations that we've done. I wanted to give an example of uh, a neural network that uh, sort of an outline of a neural network and how it all sort of fits together. Um, I actually think this is a really nice presentation. It's really sort of on the shorter side. It's hopefully only about 20 minutes long. Um, the goal really is to help you sort of wrap your mind around how a net neural network functions on the inside. You know, we've, we've got great libraries. We've got great uh, tools that will let us compute a lot of this stuff sort of at a distance. But I find that for my students who are um, master students and they, they haven't spent a lot of time in linear algebra, you, this uh, abstraction that we can do with software can make things actually harder for them. So what I've been doing is putting together this presentation and, and even the code that's here isn't mine. Um, it's Andrew Trask's and uh, it's great. It's just wonderful. Uh, there's a tendency, I think, especially in machine learning for us to have this sort of recency bias. If it's recent, we want to bring it in and use it. Oftentimes, in my experience, that's actually pretty dangerous. You want to look for the people whose ideas are the cleanest or their presentation, the material is the cleanest. Now, this, for instance, is an article that goes back to 2015, so it's quote-unquote six years old, um, and yet at the same time, it's right at the center of uh, what we're often trying to do when we're wrapping our heads around how we should think about um, deep learning and how things should move together. So I want to point you to the link to the website. I'll put up a link to, to this particular post as well, but you should check out his blog uh, in general. Of course, he's got a Twitter account that's that's interesting as, as well. He's an interesting person. So maybe we should uh, do a talk about him later. But for the time being, we're just going to uh, leech off of his great ideas and his clean presentation. Because um, from my experience, we don't often get very transparent examples of neural networks. And so I wanted to walk through these 11 lines. And it's a full-fledged neural net. Of course, it's trying to do a classification problem that's quite easy, um, but it has the guts, the heart of mostly of, of deep learning, and it's really going to point out some of the, the structural issues, and I think this is really useful. So the first most important thing for us to think about here <clears throat> is that we're going to start with our classic sort of setup, a uh, data set that's X, and X you can see is one, two, three, four rows of data, so four examples, um, with uh, three columns to describe each of those examples. So we have uh, four elements that have three features that describe them each. And we can see that Y, the matrix, uh, Y is our labels, which is also again an NP array. Uh, note that it's a transpose, so it's a column vector. And here we have the labels of zero, one, one, and zero. Very straightforward. Now what we're working with for the first couple of layers is we're gonna start talking about this um, synapses um, and these are the first layers. So we'll have this two layer neural network. You can see down here, we're gonna talk about layer one and layer two. Um, but we're going to have a random initialization of our synapses. So we'll start by looking at two times the random of a vector that's three by four. And really what we're gonna talk about mostly today is the structure of what we're dealing with down here. But for the moment, we'll just note that it's of a particular structure and then minus one, and we'll do the same thing for the first layer of the synapses where we'll have two times random, a four by one, all right? So we have um, a three by four matrix and a four by one matrix that we'll be working with. Now we'll enter the beginnings of our, our, our code um, where we'll actually be running a, you know, effectively a loop, this long loop of 60,000 um, iterations where we will take and we'll compute uh, layer one, a uh, layer two. We'll then, then we'll calculate the delta function um, that is the, the slope, the angle, um, the, the direction of our error, the direction that we should be going um, for delta 2 and delta 1. Then we'll recompute the, um, the synapses um, for layer 1 and layer 0. And then we'll keep reiterating that process over and over again. Let's just stop for a moment with the high level perspective again. We've got some data that will be fixed. That's X and Y that won't change. We've got synapses 0 and 1, which we, random, which we initialize to random values. And then we'll run over 60,000 iterations where we'll compute layer one and layer two. We'll then compute the error of layer two and layer one, you know, the direction of the error. And then we'll use that those the direction of the error to update our synapses of, of zero and one. And we'll do that over and over and over again. The goal here is to say, when we start, we'll compute, again, just, just to keep reiterating, the, the weights inside of layer one by looking at the what for the first pass is a random initialization of synapses with our original X. And then we'll compute, we'll take the output of that L1, bring it over here and compute it with, again, a random initialization of um, this, the first layer, the synapse one. And then we'll look to see at the difference between Y, our goal, and layer two right, to calculate our delta, how far off were we? And then we'll update 
Then we'll go and look and see, we'll take this L2 and we'll look based on the synapses and again, L1. So we'll look at L2 in connection with L1 to update the L1 delta and the L1 delta will be updated alongside the L2 delta and the X will be used to, be, to update the, syn the uh, synapses, the layer zero with one. So again, we're gonna compute uh, the values L1 and L2. We'll figure out how far away they are from where they should be. Then we'll update the weights in our synapses of zero and one, and we'll keep doing that over again. Compute some values, see how far away you are from where you want to be, and then update in the direction that you'd like to go. Compute, identify direction, update. Uh, uh, compute, identify direction, and update. We'll do that over and over again. So that's our main, fro this is just the framework that we're working with. You've heard these ter terms over and over again in terms of uh, deep learning, I hope, uh, but this is one way of making it very explicit. So let's get a little bit closer into what we're dealing with. So what are we doing? Our main, the main question that we're asking or the main approach that's, that, we're that we're using on this uh, first layer, the first is that we're doing a simple matrix multiplication. That is we're doing a NP dot, a dot product between X and our, in, and our again, first pass, the uh, synapses of zero. And we'll do the same thing for L2, where we'll do a dot product between the output of L1 and the synapses of L of, of uh, the synapses of layer one. Yeah. Now, what's important here is that everything else you see on the left-hand side, if we were just to be doing these dot products, we'd just be doing a linear combination, right? A, a repeated matrix multiplication. And our whole process, our whole deep learning process wouldn't be nonlinear, it would be a very linear process. And in fact, we could compress it with trivi trivially. But in our case, what we're doing is we're actually wrapping that inside the sigmoid function. Yeah. So we've got this expression that takes the output of this and runs it through a sigmoid function. So in a typical scenario, you'll often see uh, you know, a matrix multiplication and then an activation layer, some kind of sigmoid, and then a, then a matrix multiplication, then an activation layer. That's what we're doing here. We just happen to be doing it on one line. And if you read the blog, what's nice is he actually will break this apart a little bit easier, maybe to make it a little less dense, but also uh, makes it a little bit more explicit. And I think that's really helpful. For some people, like myself, I actually prefer this kind of dense presentation. It, it makes things more clear. I don't have to keep track of multiple different things on the page. Um, but for others, they don't feel that way at all. They'd much rather see it uh, sort of expanded a little bit. And he, he presents most of his from a slightly more expanded view. Um, I happen to favor this one. And uh, for the moment, we won't really worry about how the, the form of the sigmoid function. We're not going to talk about anything along those lines because today I just want to talk about kind of the, the structural or the architecture frameworks of what we're doing. So we take our, let's just to sum up, we start on the first pass. We take our data X, we multiply it in a dot product by our synapses that were random. Once we've done that, we get the output, the weights for, L, for L1. We then take those L1s and we multiply them by the synapses uh, for layer one, and we'll end up with an L2. Now L2 is really where we're, you know, sort of trying to end up. This is where we're hoping we're going to end up with, the, with our labels. Why? And so now what we will do is we, the question that we have, the question that we're going to ask is, given that um, we have this L2, I'd like to know how far away from Y, from my actual labels, is my L2? And saving you again on the math, what we'll, I'll spare you is that um, the way a sigmoid function, you calculate the derivative of a sigmoid function, um, is exactly the expression that you see here. For our purposes, we aren't going into the math today, we're just going into the structure. What you should note is that we're measuring effectively the distance between y, our goal, and what our L2 function is. And whatever that L2 delta is, whatever that angle of that delta is, we're going to sort of hold on to it. And we're going to come down here to the L1 delta. And in order to calculate the L1 delta, we're going to be asking the same thing. How far are we away from our, our L1 delta, away from where we'd like it to be? And we're going to multiply. We've, the expression becomes more complicated, which again, we're not, we're not going to address right now. But the point is that we're, we've calculated effectively not only our prediction of what our, our model, again, in the first pass, what the random synapses predict the final values would be. But then what we've done is we've gone and um, we've generated the derivative, the direction of where we need to go in order to move forward, move closer to the optimal weights that we'd like to have. Now, once we have these in hand, we have the direction, we'd like to update, we're going to update the random initializations that we had, our synapse one and our synapse zero. And we're going to do that in conjunction with the L2 deltas. So we'll take the direction that we computed for the L2 delta, and we'll take the dot product of that with L1. And we'll take, the two, we'll do the same thing. We'll update the synapses for zero by multiplying the L1 delta 
with x, the original data. And this is a backpropagation. This is passing the information back up the line so that the derivatives keep adding and we've updated our synapses. And now we sh this, these, these directions should be closer to the goal of where we would like to be. And we'll do that 60,000 times. Now, what's great is you can run this code on your own. And I recommend that you do that. But I also wanted to look at this code, not just from that framework of how I discussed it, but from a slightly different framework, which is to think about the structure of what you're working with. One of the most important things you can do when you're trying to debug deep learning code is to look at the structure of the matrices that you're passing back and forth. And so I wanted to start with the actual structure of what we're, the components that we're dealing with. So when we begin over here, what we see is we start with this uh, three by this four by three matrix. And this four by three matrix is in fact our X. So this is our X data. And we're eventually going to combine that four by three uh, matrix with uh, the, syn the uh, synapse is zero, which is a three by four matrix. Now, again, because we're primarily in terms of their interaction right here, we're using a dot product. What you might note is that when you're doing matrix by matrix multiplication, the inner values, that is the, the second value, the column value on, this, on the first object and the row value on the second object need to be matching. So you need a four by three and you can need a three by four. This could be much longer. You could have this be a, a three by 12. This could be a 10 by three, but these threes need to be the same. They need to be matching, okay? And so now we have this object and this object gets combined together to create an object that we call L1. And L1 is a four by four matrix. That is, it's a matrix that is a square and it has the leading value here and the and the following value here to create the structure. And so now we have an L1 matrix and our L1 matrix is going to be combined and interact with what will eventually become the synthetic uh, one matrix. And our synthetic one matrix is a four by one matrix. So you can see where we are again, four by one, multiplying these two together. I need to make sure that the four here matches the four here. These synapses, the synapses will generate an L2 matrix. Now this L2 matrix is going to be our, you know, our substitute for Y. So we, we, we took our data, we used uh, a matrix multiplication to expand it into this square four by four matrix. And then we're going to um, compress it down using this, uh, this um, synapsis here to a possible prediction where each entry corresponds to the prediction that we expect for, um, for Y. So what values should be here. And now we're going to have this combination. We'll have L2, which is our, what we sort of like a Y hat. It's what we think Y would be um, given the synapses zero and the synapses one that we were working with. And we'll use that to compare with the actual Y to compute out an L2 delta. This L2 delta, of course, will need to interact with L2 delta. We'll need to interact with the synapses one. That is the synapses that we were working with here. And it will need to interact with our um, L1 layer, the first layer, all of which will compute an L1 delta. And we see the L1 delta is a four by four matrix. And if you were to stop for a moment, you would note that the L1 delta, the angles and the derivatives here for L1 are in a shape that's similar to the L1 uh, delta that we actually worked with, or sorry, the L1 object that we actually worked with. Now, we'll also note that in the same time, we'll, we'll take this L1 and we'll need to compute it with our L2 delta. So the L1 delta will interact with the L2 delta, which will generate an update of our synapses one. And our original data, this XT, uh, will interact with our uh, four by four uh, delta to create a new matrix that looks like this, this three by four matrix, with this, which is a, a synapse uh, zero. So the progression as we move through the space of uh, of all the different sizes and all the different uh, dimensions of our uh, matrix really, uh, in my mind, really makes it a lot easier if you do keep do 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 keep track and do uh, sort of tally. And one of the things that's uh, the fastest, best ways to very quickly make uh, adaptations to your code to make sure that it runs faster is to check the structures and the formats. Because at any point where any of these multiplications are in fact incorrect, um, you will find that the objects are not going to generate the values that you would expect. Uh, and that can be uh, quite problematic. Right. So um, I also want to note that this matrix, this structure that we have in 11 lines of code has a corresponding um, structure, um, which really looks, you know, something like this. If we were to in, uh, bring in some type of sequential model, you know, we're going to use uh, stochastic gradient descent. We're going to have a dense network. 
Um, and we'll create this model. It's a sequential model. Uh, we're going to add one layer. The layer has four, uh, four values. The activation is a sigmoid. Uh, the shape is three. That's the input shape. And we come in with three, three column vectors. Then we have a model that has a dense output that's a layer one. So this is our, our layer um, our layer one. Excuse me, our layer two. This is our, our hypothesized Y with an activation that's again sigmoid. And then we're going to use uh, stochastic gradient descent. We'll use accuracy as a metric. We'll run a model summary or a model fit for 60,000 um, epochs. And this, this exactly right here is, is not exactly. This is basically the same framework of what we're working with as we go through this whole process. So listen, um, what I like about this discussion isn't that uh, the code that we're covering in this 11 lines are necessarily going to be the way you're going to run anything in terms of uh, real world work, but rather I think it's a very nice way of having a simple, small enough example that you can get your hands on and get your fingers dirty with to figure out exactly how this code is going to work if you were to write it from the very ground up. Now, of course, things are always easier if you have a library along these lines, but this doesn't show you um, nearly as clearly the fact that, uh, you know, how the math is actually coming together and how the matrix multiplications are happening. One of the things I find that happens the most often is when I talk to students, um, they don't recognize that without these sigmoid functions, we would just have a linear combination of values, and therefore we wouldn't be in a position to have the nonlinearity that we expect from a neural net. And it's really the basis of the activation functions that give us that that give us that flexibility. Uh, I really recommend that you have a chance to look at his page. I know I've talked very quickly through this. I wanted to make it very fast. Um, so that you can start to pick it apart. I'm sure there are some mistakes in here. Uh, feel free to note those uh, in the comments. I think that's actually really quite useful. Things are not supposed to be perfect. They're supposed to be useful and functional. And uh, I hope that this serves along those lines. Thanks.